everyone. Welcome to Musicality number two. And I hope that you have enjoyed your tea last week. And today we are going to have another exciting class. So um, you're probably wondering how come I have all this problem in front of me. Actually, today it's very special that we did not do last week is we are going to make something today. So today we are going to make a Chinese um, we call sticky rice ball, but actually more familiar for Americans is probably mochi, uh, just like the Japanese, but I don't know, you know, I don't know if the Chinese gave the recipe to the Japanese or Japanese actually very generously share with the Chinese. I don't really know the history of mo mochi, but today we're gonna make it and it's very, very easy. So now I'm gonna put gloves on. Okay, so I know you think that we're gonna brew tea first, but then hang on to it. We are going to get to our tea very soon. But today we are, I'm just gonna show you how to make the sticky rice ball. And if you have ingredients nearby that you can get, that you can definitely enjoy it and then make it this week. Okay, so right in front of me, we are going to make the filling first. And today this ball is gonna be wrapped by a sticky rice um, kind of like a um, skin type of uh, just like a dumplings and then we will wrap with a um, homemade not really homemade I really do not grow the sesame seeds but we are going to use uh, some sesame uh, powder that I purchased in the store that you can get in any oriental store then I have some powdered sugar and this is my regular oil which is um, not the extra virgin olive oil because it's a little bit stronger in smell. So you want to use just a regular oil. Okay, let's go ahead and make it. I'm a person that do not like to use a lot of disposable stuff. So what I'm going to use is a little tiny container. I'm going to dump. Um, don't worry, you're all going to get the recipe uh, for the class. Okay, here we have a quarter cup of uh, sesame powder. Then I'm going to dump my powdered sugar in as well. If you like it very sweet, definitely make it very sweet. And if you like it less sweet, then don't use that much of powdered sugar. Okay, first of all, we're going to mix it together gently. So when we have our oil, it's more mixed, it's better mixed well. Okay, here we go. Then I'm gonna put two tablespoons of oil into it. Sometimes it happens in the kitchen. Okay, here we go. All right. Just put it in here. And guess what? That's all you need for the filling. Is that easy? Of course, you have to have a little bit of labor work. We're well, going to mix it. Okay, I'm going to put this on the side. Ooh, I'm going to block your view. Okay, here we go. We're going to mix it until very well. If you think that uh, I don't have enough. Um, liquid. Wait until another 30 seconds. You'll see they're all well incorporated. And because of the oil, that was sticking this together, but you can say 
Are we able to roll it into little balls? Here's a little trick. Then later, I'm gonna pop this into the freezer while making the skin, the wrap, the sticky rice wrap. You see, start to fall together. Okay, yeah. What I'm gonna do, ooh, come here, little sesame paste. Do you see? Those are the sesame paste that we're looking for. It's a little soft. Um, after all, we have to roll it into little balls. So I'm gonna pat it down. Pat it down to black one. This is what easier handling of uh, this sticky pad. Sticky pad. Sticky paste. Okay, here we go. Now, easily, well, I'm gonna separate them. Just kind of um, using a butter knife. Go over down there. All right. Okay, see that? It's so flat. And I'm just gonna have to separate them. So later, we are going to, our recipe can make a 12 uh, mochi. So I'm gonna kind of um, put a little separation line over there and then pop into the freezer. All right, so easy enough, 12 portion. 12 portions of a little thing. And when we pop into the uh, freezer later, we harden, it'll be a lot easier for us to roll. So let's go. Let's do that. Okay, oh, it's best to, to close the lid just in case there's any disaster happening in the freezer. Okay, so we'll see you later. Okay, now I'm back, very quick. So now we're gonna make the skin. It's also very easy. This is what we call sticky rice powder. Sometimes we, we call it uh, glutinous rice powder or sweet rice powder, and they have a different type of brand. So um, let's show you that, that we right now in the market that you can purchase easily online or in the Chinese market that they, you can get um, even bulk meal. They make a sweet rice. Make sure that you don't get regular rice powder. It's a sweet rice. Okay, so it's very delicious. Okay, here we go. I'm using a microwave safe container. Again, I don't want to use those as saran wraps. So I thought about that maybe we can use the, our tradition that we have this little, little corningware that has a lid so we don't need to use the saran wrap around it. And then this is a quarter cup of regular sugar. If you like a darker color, you can actually use dark brown sugar and it also look beautiful. It's a little bit light brown and it's delicious as well. But today I figured that since we're in the tea class, what you can do is in your liquid, you can replace it with tea. So earlier this morning, I drank some green tea. Now I save a cup for myself to make my mochi. And look at that color. Although it probably won't show as much as you is you anticipate it, but a little bit color than better than, than uh, water. So what I'm gonna do is have a whisk. You definitely wanna the flour dissolve very, very well. Okay, so the liquid looks like um, a little bit like milk. I don't want any lump. Here we go. I'm getting them over there. It's getting there, it's getting there. I know you're anxious to make these mochi projects. And this is very common when you drink tea, any kind of tea, it goes very well. It's very soft. With my recipe, it doesn't harden for at least three days. So after you make your mochi, you can keep them in the refrigerator, but make sure you cover it up. Otherwise it will dry it out from, from um, the refrigeration. So I think I'm almost ready. Can you see? 
Ah, no lumps. And I'm gonna have to take it on the cover, uh, the corners. Okay, here we go. Now all set. What are we gonna do? Close the lid. And I'm gonna pop in the microwave for three minutes. So if you don't want to make 12 mochi, you just want to make six, if you only have two people, then you can actually reduce the recipe into half and then use the one and a half. Um, my microwave is pretty strong. It's about 1500 power. So let's do that. Okay. Okay, while we're waiting, I want to clean this up and I'm going to show you what's next. So I have a little tray over here. And then this is cornstarch because the dough, when it comes out, it's very, very sticky. And if you don't use some kind of uh, agent that it's gonna climb clean up to your hand that you can't really get it off. That's quite um, embarrassing moment. So this is cornstarch. If you worry about the cornstarch and you're not feeling comfortable to eat it raw, you could pop in the microwave for 30 seconds. If this app pop in the microwave for 30 seconds, I'm gonna generously sprinkle on my little tray here. And I'm gonna save some for later when I dump the dough into this container and on top I'll sprinkle more. Okay, let's see. That looks good. Here we go. Now. And then you need a little spatula. When the dough comes out from the microwave, it's very hot. So don't really attempt to be a hero and touch the dough because you could burn your hand. But be very, very careful. Okay. Now let's see um, how it goes with our sesame ball. Sesame ball. I haven't made it yet. What? Well, already, you already know the secret. So I'm gonna go check. Of course, I would prefer this to be made a little bit ahead of time, but we're just gonna use it and I will demonstrate how this will work. So now here, remember this is spatula that I had before. I'm just gonna demonstrate. I will scoop it out. Of course, this was just um, pop in there for a minute or two. And you will gently roll it into a tiny little ball. You see that? You can make a tiny ball, right? Okay. Uh, I would need. To, I'm just gonna put down the lid for now. Let's do it again. We'll put another one. And because I previously make a little session for it, so it's very easy to scoop it up and roll it to another ball. So you can continue making them until you have 12 balls. And what, will I, what I would do is if you make it um, ahead of time, you can pop it back into the freezer, make it really hardened, and it'll be just so much easier to roll. Okay, since our dough is not ready yet, so I'm gonna make another one. Okay, let's see. Whew. Now I hear that our dough is ready. We're gonna get it out from the microwave. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Just want to let you know, I can never do this by myself. And so I don't know if you know that I have a group of people behind me and help me out for this class. Okay, here we go. Now, here's our thing. It's extremely hot. All right. I want to show you how beautiful this one is. So be careful. You want to kind of scrape down. Scrape it down. I'm going to use a fork. Mix them together because sometimes the center may not cook completely and you want to mix them a little well and it'll cook. Promise. So the time to cook the this uh, sticky rice liquid is really depends on the power of your microwave. So if you think your microwave is not as powerful, then you can add, you can test it. If it's still very running, then you pop into your microwave for another 30 seconds or a minute. So every 30 seconds, we want to check. Okay. 
So what are we going to do is normally I'll wait until it's really cooler. But today, since you're so important, I'm going to show you right now with my hand. This is the hot liquid coming here. Okay, dump into it. See how gluey that is? But don't worry. That means it's very delicious and soft. This is perfect for all ages. You see that? You can see that running little jello thing. Now I'm gonna sprinkle more of the cornstarch. And you say, wait a minute, are we eating cornstarch? But don't worry. I have a special tool to help you. Later, we can dust off the cornstarch. So you will not be like eating raw cornstarch all the time. So I'm gonna actually help my dough You see that? Okay, now, gently, whew, very sticky and it's still very hot. Okay, see the big dough over here? And I'll separate it into 12 portions. It's very easy to cut. If you have a cookie cutter, that's easy. And this one, I can go. So since we have time to strain, I'm just going to demonstrate one or two. All right. See over here? Now we got little pieces of the little dough. Okay, I'm going to pick this one. And all you have to do is use your hand. Kind of rotate it until it's a little bit round. Okay, it's really hot still. But you can wait until it's cooler. I'm just showing you. So what you do is take sesame ball, put it in the center, and wrap it up. And kind of, and it's still in the back, but you want to put it in the bottom, and then you start to go round and round and round, kind of shape it, kind of shape it, and it's still very hot. Of course, you can wait until it's cooler. So I'm not gonna help it on my hands too much longer. Just wanna show you one. Okay, here we go. Now we have wow mochi. Okay, you get to enjoy it when it's cooler. Oh, I'm sorry for the mess. Look at this. Okay, then afterwards you can put in a container like this. And then we'll be able to store it for two or three days and you can enjoy with your tea or even after the meal. Okay, here we go. So now we're finished with our sweet making. Here we go. Thank you very much, my team. They're just lovely people. Okay, now we're gonna move our prop here. I'm sure you're ready for your tea, right? Okay, does everyone have the teapot and everything ready? I'm going to take this off. Allow me. Taking the plastic thing off in front of you. You know, so I'm going to be off um, the screen for about two seconds because I would like to take off my apron. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, Ooh, I'm back. Mmm, yummy, yummy stuff. Okay, now, here we go. I'm gonna take my tea. Okay, now we're back. So today, I wanna show you how to um, make tea with Kung Fu style. I don't know if you're familiar with the word of Kung Fu. Kung Fu, you probably think that a ha, ha, ha. All this kind of uh, from the Kung Fu movies, but actually Kung Fu means the excellence and customership in um, you're just very good. It's very skillful that that you can call someone has the Kung Fu. So Kung Fu means you bring away that everyone can enjoy the tea. So if I say everyone, that means I'm going to brew for my team as well. Okay, so I have two teapots, about 150 mil roughly. And why do I have two pots? Because one pot I'm going to brew today's tea, but the other tea 
is actually from the same origin. What I mean is the same, a single origin. That means the teas are made from the same plantation, from the same tea garden. And, but if you know that tea all made from the same plant, and just because the processing is different, so they come out differently. So this way, we both we use the same tea, same tea leaves. We make a two different kind of tea. One is the tea we have today. It's called light oolong, but it's the processing is more of like a high mountain tea of a kind of a processing. So it's a lot lighter, and you can see when you receive the tea, it's a, like a dark green and forest green. It's very very beautiful. Um, that way. We, why don't we call it high mountain oolong tea? The high mountain oolong tea can be only defined for the teas that grow above 1,000 meters in Taiwan. So our tea, the Jinsi Tea Garden, is actually lower than 1,000 uh, meters. But don't get me wrong, not because it's not high mountain tea, it's not good tea. That's totally missed. That's not right. Okay, all teas all tea gardens can produce beautiful, beautiful teas, regardless their elevation. It's just the way we define it. Okay, now here um, we're having our tea uh, being brewed right now. So the other tea is a regular one, is not uh, just produced as a regular oolong, not the high mountain tea, that kind of process. And the regular oolong, we actually have roasted a little bit, but very lightly roasted. So we will brew it and we'll see the different color um, from the same plant, the same plantation, and can make a different type of tea. I'm always be amazed with that. Okay. So here's our tea today. And we're all going to use the whole bag, which is eight gram. Why do we use so much? Remember, this is Kung Fu style. And for Kung Fu style, the difference of Kung Fu style and Western style is the volume of the water, or you can say the volume of teas. We use more teas in the Kung Fu style. Um, but the thing is, when you have tea in the pot, you don't want to let it sit for so long because you have so much tea inside. And this reminds me, like, if you listen to the same piece of music and being played by a string ensemble and the full orchestra, the sound and volume and depth is so different. However, the music is still there. It's still beautiful, but you taste it with a different aspect. Okay, so now I'm going to warm up the pot. Remember, always warm up your teapot. Okay. Hello. Okay, here we go. I should have removed my... Okay, we're gonna close this. Remember last week, I said how to test that uh, if your brewing vessel is ready, touch your lid. Still a little cold. No, I can still feel the warmth. Now, it's starting. So let it cook a little bit. Now flip this over. These are our sharing jug. Why do we use this? This is very common. Um, I'm using this one particularly, this glass does allow you to see the colors. But this is very common for a complex style brewing because the vessel, brewing vessel is so small and you have a big crowd. And because we have a lot of tea leaves inside, we can actually brew in more than one brew. And I wanna show you, um, it's slightly changed in the timing. And I will tell you why in brewing. So let's move this, this one out. I would like to really appreciate my team. So I'm gonna offer them some tea today. Okay, now after I brew, I uh, warm up my teapot, so don't ever waste your water. Guess what? I'm going to warm up my tea jar. That would be nice. And this one goes here. All right. So now our teapot is warmed. So this one is our tea today. I'm going to put in this yellow teapot. 
close the lid. Let it sit a little bit. Then I will put this um, single origin for this regular Uno to the other one. They have the same, they're the same capacity. So both are 150 ml. And if you like to smell, why um, we cannot smell the dry leaves because some people just go into the tea shop and they say, oh, I'm gonna smell the tea, tea leaves. Actually, it doesn't, you can't use the dry tea leaves smell to, to get some kind of indication of the quality of the tea because they just don't, because the tea cannot be uh, smelled unless it's been heated. So this is the way um, a lot of people go into the tea shop and they smell it and say, oh, this smells nice. So they can be fooled. For example, if people tell you, say, have you drank a milk oolong? You think milk oolong should smell like milk. So artificially, they will scent the tea with milk. And you think you're buying something like really high quality. Actually, no. But that's also a sad part is that people will walk into the tea shop and they want to smell something because they have not never taste the tea. So nowadays, the scented teas are very popular. But are you really smelling the tea or are you actually smelling some kind of scent? from coconut, from chocolate, or from vanilla. So that's the thing that um, we have to be careful because these um, ingredients are a lot cheaper than your tea leaves. So, okay, now we're ready to brew. So I'm going to brew this. Remember, it's gonna be very fast. The first brew only for 25 seconds. Okay, let's see, this one goes first. And that one. We try to be quick. So we'll try to be fair because we have to spend. Okay, 25 seconds. In the meantime, I'm gonna warm up the cups. Okay, now I warm up. So your your guests are not drinking off the teacups that are cold. Mm -hmm. And then more likely, okay, time's up. Short time, isn't it? Now this one was first. Why do we have a tea jug, a sharing jug? Because the first brew and the second brew is so different. And you want to be, you want to share with others, you want them to drink all the same quality of teas. Okay, I want to show you the, the different color. Uh, for these two teas. Okay, now I'm also going to open this for you to see. You can't really tell too much from it, right? But see, at the beginning, remember there were all these hard balls. Now they start to expand. You say, oh, I don't use a lot of the teas, but no, look at that. Later, they will all expand more. Okay, I wonder if you can see the color. Are they different? Very different, huh? This one is darker, this one's lighter. So this is today's tea, that's a high mountain tea, very much lightly oxidized. And this is heavier oxidized, plus a little bit roasting. So we're gonna offer the tea, but now I'm going to brew the second brew. But this time, second brew, because it's already open, you don't want to brew it very long, so it's actually be shorter than the first one, okay? So 20 seconds, and the other one. All right, I think I'm trying to be fair. Okay, so here, only 20 seconds, really short time. So now I have warm up. I'm using the time to dump the water for my guests. Hopefully I can do it fast enough when it's done brewing. I'm all done. Ooh, actually, it's time's up. Ooh, boy. Boy. Okay. Really need a lot of hands. Okay. The second one. So this one. And our first one should have to do this one first. 
but you, you can see the beautiful color. One is more of um, golden yellow. The other one is a light pale yellow. And you can see, very, very obvious, huh? Isn't that beautiful? That's what I like to tell you. That tea is widely drunk by a lot of people in the world. There's only one beverage that drunk by more people is water. So guess what? You will enjoy this. This is our regular tea. And can everyone come back for our second batch of this? I'm sorry, I have uh, served you the wrong tea. <laughs> it's not really wrong, but this is our regular oolong. And um, later, we're all going to enjoy this lighter today's tea. OK, we'll wait for later. OK, now let's move on to our next. I would like to tell you what's the difference of these teas? How come they can make a different colors? Do you know that teas, even though I said it's from the same plantation and from the same plants, but because the processing is different. So there are six basic different types of teas. The six different kind of teas that um, you want to guess the first one. How about the first one would be green tea, and the second one would be you. You probably gonna say I'm gonna say white tea. But how come can tea be white? And the third one is called yellow tea. Then the next one would be oolong tea, and then black tea but in china we actually call it red tea because the color is actually orange red okay and then the following one you brew the tea liquor is so dark it's called post fermented tea uh, well we'll explain it later but now you know we actually give a name called dark tea it's really really dark okay so the difference is as i said before these six teas can come from the same plant the same plant called Camellia sinensis. And the Camellia sinensis is this kind of drink that if you process it a different way, then you'll become green tea. Okay, let's explore a little bit to that. If it's green tea, it's slightly weathered. What is weather? That means you that it's said and that it relax a little bit. And at that time, the moisture from the plant itself will actually evaporate a little bit, but you don't want to do it too long. Okay, so green tea basically for a very short time, then you have to kill green. What does that mean? That means the tea is actually interacting with uh, oxygen, but you don't want them to do that. You want to keep the most um, fresh and uh, original uh, substance in the tea. So you want the enzyme that kind of uh, interacting with uh, uh, oxygen to stop. So we call it kill green. Then then that's why sometimes you say, oh, green tea is not oxidized. But actually, uh, in the process, you can't avoid not to be oxidized. But it's very, very little, almost not. Okay. And then the next one called white tea, not because the tea becomes white, but it's very pale. The way white tea is that it wither a little bit, but then then you go and dry. So it's the easiest tea, however. The easiest thing, the simple thing, has the most profound meaning to it. So you will see, that's why white tea is not very popular, because it's very hard to make. If you miss it for five minutes, or you have too much moisture in the air, your tea crop basically is ruined. You can't make white tea anymore. So it's very, very delicate, most delicate tea among all six. And the next one is yellow tea. And what's the difference of a yellow tea? So the old teas look, look kind of yellow. What is a yellow tea? Yellow tea is basically made the way just like a green tea, but green tea, you know, um, after it being killed grain, then you dry it. But yellow tea has an extra process. They make the green tea go through some kind of um, hot bath. So it let it sit in a room for a little while. Then if you are a very young and energetic green tea, like a teenager girl, but after you are being wrapped up and then sit and then they calm down a little bit, you are a little mellower. So yellow tea is a little mellower than green tea. Now let's go on to oolong. Oolong tea 
is the most versatile teas among them all because from green, white, and yellow, basically they are not really being oxidized, right? Or even though during the process they may be oxidized accidentally a little bit, but no more than 10%. But when you go to the next level of black tea, it's almost 95, 90%, almost 100% oxidized. Now, what kind of tea is in between, between 10 and 90? Those are all called oolong tea. So oolong tea can be a category. If you do it differently, um, the oolong tea can be just oxidized to 20%. And then they go to another types of oolong tea that's um, oxidized to 80%. Of course, they're going to taste differently. So oolong tea, you can, because of the processing, you can make so many different kinds. I say this really versatile. Okay, so that's oolong. And then black tea, as I just said, that basically they have the more time to be oxidized. They love the um, oxygen. Uh, to me, green tea is a teenage girl, but black tea is like a middle aged woman like me. We are very delightful, but we are also very accommodating because we just have so much experience about life. So that's my feeling about the green tea and black tea, but you can think of your own way of saying this. Now, next category called post-fermented tea. It's totally not in this category at all. This post-fermented tea, the most famous one is the pu'er tea. Some people say, oh gosh, am I drinking dirt? because that has that character that poor tea just for some people is smell and it tastes like old furniture or it's smell like you know the, the dirt you just got from your garden it's because after it's being made green tea or green tea again green tea is very important huh then they will allow it to they will give it some kind of bacteria it's good bacteria and that is it so there are two, two different types of um a poor tea. One is called raw poor. That means they will let the poor tea itself naturally to age. And it can take 10 years, it can take 20 years, some are 30 years. So the longer the poor tea you have, it's actually more valuable. However, it needs to be actually hold it in the right way. Otherwise, you could be tasting some really bad for your tea. And then the other kind is because it's so valuable, people think it is very uh, beneficial to your health. And so a lot of people making a lot nowadays. And how do you make, you, you can't really make your raw poor as they tell your poor tea, they say, come on, age faster. So they artificially, they thought of a way in China, they actually put the tea in a very moist room, controlled, very well controlled, and actually spray some moist on the tea. So expedite the aging process. And this kind of tea, this kind of poor tea can be tasted within two years. Now some of you can get five years, but a lot faster. It's about five times faster than the naturally fermented tea. Okay enough of talking about how they've been processed. So I would like to show you a chart, maybe a little bit easier for you to understand. Right, um, you can um, kind of look at, look at how short the white tea, uh, the process of the white tea. If you cannot see the whole screen, use your ESC button and that, then make your screen a little bit smaller, then you will be able to see the, the whole six T's in the process chart. So uh, you can see the white tea. Oh, it's just weathering. Why is that too weathering? You think it's wrong? Well, white tea requires outdoor weathering and later they're gonna move into indoors to weather a little bit. So that's why the two weathering stages. Then you dry, that's all. But within this weathering, it's a, it's a high technique to monitor the timing. So, well, you will get this information um, uh, after the class. So don't worry that you have not memorized it. Um, if you insist, I could give a quiz next week, if you insist, but I'm not planning to. Okay, let's go on to, let's explore all other teas and then let's take a look of the real tea leaves and see how we can brew them. There's some other technique, very simple technique, but you just have some tips you have to keep in mind. Did I say green tea is like teenage girls? 
that um, they're very easily to be um, to be hurt, and they're very young. They have they're full with energy and with all this all this human human beings all the health benefits on it. Actually, all the teas have all the health benefits. It's just the green tea is more obvious. And because it's been reserved for more of the substances. So we, we think that green tea is better than any other tea, but no, all kinds of teas have that kind of benefit. So on the very left and right, you see different, three different kinds of teas that we are going to very quickly look at this. So I've shown you the green teas. They're all very green, as you can see. This is matcha, which is powder like. And then these are Chinese green tea. And look at the difference. I'm going to put this here. I wonder if you can see. I'm going to try to pin those. Um, um, the matcha is a powder type. And then this is a Japanese green tea, it's called Shancha, and this is uh, Chinese green tea. The difference is Chinese use pen to kill the green, but Japanese just steam it, okay? Then how do we brew these teas? Because they're so easy to be heard. So I would recommend a lower temperature to brew your green teas. And um, for the recipes, that I will send it to you after the class. So we don't have to have a detailed discussion over here that you get to see the differences of using Kung Fu style and uh, Western style brewing. You will get that information, so don't worry. Now here's your green tea. How about the next one, the white tea? I wanna explain the differences over here. One white tea has this little fur on it. That's called silver needle. And I have it over here. Look at this. You can see the little fur. Okay, because it's all buds. The very top, the very fine part of the tea. As soon as they come out, they pick. So the best white tea, very, very precious ones, contains not, no leaves, but just the very top of the buds. Okay, and then that's why this naturally have a little fur on it. But then go on to the next grade. It still tastes wonderful. It's called white peony. So you have buds, this one, and have some leaves. Okay. White teas are very beneficial to your health as well. It's, it's considered one of the medicinal drink for Chinese. We think that can actually cure your fever. Okay, now next time, next we are gonna go on to oolong tea. And basically there are two kinds of oolong tea. I wonder if you can see. One is really bally, just like the one we have today. It's like a little ball and it has a different shape. Some balls are bigger than the other because oolong teas are made with leaves and they pick up to third or fourth leaf. That's why this there is so large and have a different size. And when they're processing it, oolong tea has the most complicated processing than any other tea. So oolong tea, if you think oolong tea is expensive, think about the labor. Each one of this little ball has gone through at least 21 rolling. 21, okay. Now the other kind of uh, oolong tea is the strip. So that will require a little less time in brewing. Now we're gonna go on to, oh, we've got the yellow tea. Yellow tea. <laughs> Looks very much like green tea, right? But a little bit yellower, so you can see. Okay, here we go. Yeah, okay. Yellow teas are very rare, and most people don't know how to appreciate it, but maybe we will learn one day. So we will be in details in other classes. If you don't think that um, we have enough time to brew, that we know we don't have enough time. Okay, now here we go. I'm gonna move on to the black tea. Okay, I'm showing you three types of um, black tea. And one is very large leaf. That's called Camellia sinensis or Semica. That's still Camellia sinensis, just the leaves are bigger. 
Then the middle one has a smaller leaf. You see the difference, but they're all black teeth. Remember, it's because the processing is different. The third one looks like a little tiny little pearls. These are called CTC black teas, and they are being pre-chopped and rolled and do that, so they're very tiny. Okay, last one I want to show you is my precious cake of the dark tea. So these are real cakes. And the way you break them up, you use a little um, a little knife. This is particularly made for poor tea, but if you don't have one, guess what this is? This is when you cook your turkey. This works very well. Okay, here's my, this one already been eaten by me. Okay, drinking, and you can just poke it, lift. You, don't, you do not want to chop the whole cake because then you'll chop the leaf. But this way, and gently put it up and you will have a little piece holding it up and put it in your tea clip. Okay, good, very nice. Now we're ready to take a sip of our tea. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna have a sip of our beautiful tea today, if you're drinking with me. Um, the music we will listen to, and who's the composer? Let's ask Bugs Bunny. Okay, Bugs Bunny played this piece very well, but somehow he just does not know who the composer is. by list, the most famous Hungarian Rhapsody number two. Okay, Bugs Bunny did not know who Liszt is, but I want to briefly tell you that by the age of nine, he's already appearing on concert halls. And what's really amazing is that um, he was so welcomed by everybody that not every pianist received this kind of award or a reputation that um, all the ladies just fell in love with him. And at age 12, then he went to Paris, wanted to enter the conservatory, famous conservatory, but he was denied because he was a foreigner. But you wouldn't believe it. years later, he took Paris as a storm. At age 22, he ran into, he met his first love, which is a countess. The countess fell in love with him and wanted to stay with him. So he, she actually left her husband and just to live with Liszt. But he encouraged that Liszt to make a lot of competition. So by the time when Liszt was with, with her, um, not only they raised three children, never got married, unfortunately, um, but they have three children and then he also made a lot of composition. By about the mid of the 1840s, that of course these two lovers just don't get along and then they've just not been able to be together. So Liszt brought 
his children with him back to Paris and resume his touring, um, um, touring pianist as his career. But then at some time that he met another married woman who is the princess. They are so in love that the princess left her husband and children. I just want to give a list. Okay. Now you see um, the photo you can see on the uh, PPT that he isn't he handsome? It's probably the reason. That's why. But when Lister was a child, he was always had the calling of being a, a, a religious calling. He's always reading in a fund of reading religious books and he wants to be a priest one day, you know. Actually, eventually towards the end of his life, he was able to become a priest and he has to perform some um, uh, orders for the Catholic churches. He also was one, uh, the composer that composed so many uh, music, the one very unique style is called symphonic poem that was invented by him. Symphonic poem is like an opera. You have the drama, but you don't sing it out loud. You use the instrument to describe the story. And that's invented by Liszt. So, you know, he had the three children, even though eventually he couldn't marry the princess. The princess went with him and then they asked Rome that if we can get married, but eventually they just cannot legally get married. So towards the end of his life, Liszt was not married at all. And what's very sad is um, when his son was 20 years old, he lost him, he died. And two years later, one of his daughters died as well. And that really struck Liszt a lot. And he couldn't bear this kind of sadness. And he's just looking for a religious um, healing to his life. But he still helped his daughter because his fame and his, popul his popularity and his reputation. His daughter, his one remaining child is running a summer camp in Germany. And he, she always asked the father to come because only the father can really save the camp and a lot of people will come. So on the very last year in July, 1886, Lest gave his final concert in Luxembourg. Then he went to Fort Worth in Germany to help his daughter to run the summer camp. Unfortunately, his health is really deteriorating. So three days later, after camp is finished, he died in um, Germany. So that was a um, very controversial and very dramatic life of a great composer and great pianist. And today we are going to listen to his uh, one of the most famous love songs called Liebestraum, that's in German. Uh, this is actually composed, supposed to be three pieces in a set but we are not going to listen to number three. And the meaning of a Liebestraum was uh, derived from a poem by the, the poet that the Freling Graf, that it means that love as long as you can. Who's gonna play the piece for us? Will be one of my favorite pianists, Claudia Aral, who was a Chilean uh, pianist, although he is, um, passed away a long time ago, but his recording remains in the world and still being cherished by most of the pianists like us. Um, why do I pick his interpretation today? Uh, you have to know that uh, he actually studied with a person, his teacher, that Martin Krauss was a student of Liszt. So obviously, Aral learned the interpretation from Krauss and then learn from Liszt. And guess what? Who taught Liszt? Czerny. And who taught Czerny? Beethoven. So Beethoven taught Czerny, Czerny taught Liszt, Liszt taught Krauss, Krauss taught Arau. Arau had a very unique and very intimate relationship with his piano teacher. Although in the fifth year, um, Martin Krauss died while Aral was still very young. And Claudia Aral loved his teacher so much that he's never ever studied with another person again. So even though later on he became a great pianist, but basically all self-taught. And his repertoire, repi 
represents almost all across the whole um, Western music span, that he could play 76 solo concert without repetition of any piece, straight, 76, plus 60 pieces with the orchestra. So by himself, he could play half the year, every single night without repeating anything. So his repertoire is so massive. But I truly love his interpretation of the, the um, Lieber drum today. And you probably asked me, what does that have to do with the tea today? If you have tasted the tea today, like I just did, it's very refreshing, very sweet. This reminds me of love. And I hope you love this tea and let's enjoy this music.
how you have enjoyed the music from so relaxed now and your lives into one. I hope you grew some more tea for your loved ones. And of course, you have to love yourself as well. Okay, now our time is up. So I hope um, if you have any questions, you can also type in in our, um, in our chat room or you have had my email and you can send your question to us and some of the, the, the questions that is the for teas is very subjective. So some people like this tea, some people break this way, some people use that way, some people brew the green teas with the boiling water, some people, this is all personal preference. What's important is do you love to drink tea? So I'll see you next time. Thank you very much. And you will receive my post-class reminder tomorrow. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye.